Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Know Before You Go, Ultimate Australia Safari, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Matt Meyer. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away, Matt. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, great to be back. It's been a minute since uh, the last one, and I think it was actually a Australia North now before you go um, last year. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks to everyone for tuning in today. Um, we've got a lot to cover over a very short amount of time. Um, and as any of you who have uh, watched any of my webinars before, um, I can talk quite a bit. So we've got about 50 slides to get through. I'm going to go through them as quickly as I can by giving you as much information as possible. And then at the end, as Rob mentioned, have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Ultimate Australia, this is something that all of us Australia expedition leaders and our local team have been looking forward to since it was first moment a couple of years ago, um, because it really does comprise the best of Australia condensed down into a three week period. Um, so I'm gonna start off um, by, we don't really uh, need too much time to introduce the uh, the relationship between NatHab and the WWF, um, partners now for over 20 years. Um, and there are a few areas that we go to on our ultimate trip um, where we can see a bit of the work that's being done, some of the recovery programs that um, have happened after the 2019-2020 fires and then also the work on an area like the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so thanks to NatHab for putting these together. Uh, it's a great way to connect us all and some of you who might be joining us in a few weeks time for the uh, the first of its kind of our ultimate trips. We've got a departure leaving in about three weeks and then another one about 40 days or so after that. Um, so where are we? We're in Australia. If you look at Australia here, um, it's about the size of the continental US plus a little bit of Canada. Um, so it's a massive range and we are doing our best to get in everything that um, we can pretty much on the eastern side of, um, of the big island as the folks in Tasmania call the main in Australia. Um, so we arrive and start in Cairns. And then from Cairns, we head up into the world's oldest rainforest, the Daintree Rainforest. We spent a couple of days there um, and then down to the Atherton Tablelands, which is a little bit further south um, of that, kind of in a parallel with Cairns there. Then we head down to Brisbane. We spent a night in Brisbane, followed by three fantastic days on uh, the most southern Coral Cay Island of the Great Barrier Reef, Lady Elliot Island. Is one of um, only half a dozen or so islands that you can actually stay on the reef. And it's a really, really, it's one of the newer islands um, because it's a Coral Cay island. It's kind of, as you'll see in photos just now, um, Coral Cay basically means created from broken down coral. Um, and it's right at the very southern tip and as close as you can get to the continental drop off um, of Australia on the Great Barrier Reef, which runs all the way from north of Cairns down to uh, a little bit north of Brisbane. So we spent a night in Brisbane then three nights on Lady Elliot, then back to Brisbane for a night. And then we head down to Tasmania, the little island, the largest of the three islands, well, the, the largest of the islands um, of Australia. And we're there for a couple of days. Uh, we fly down to the main uh, city center of Hobart. And from Hobart, we go to Maria Island um, followed by a few days in the central plateau and then up into the northwestern area where we finished at Cradle Mountain. From there, um, we hop across to um, Rawnsby Station, which is near the um, Ikara Flinders Ranges, uh, north of Adelaide, um, where there's this spectacularly beautiful, almost um, Caldabra rock formation. Uh, known as Wilpina Pound, and it's the gorges and the canyons that uh, are in amongst that area. You're looking at rocks that are like 500 million years old. Um, and uh, some of the oldest fossils in Australia are found uh, in this region. And then from there, we hop onto our last uh, charter flight. So we do a, um, a commercial airline from Cairns to Brisbane, a commercial airline from Brisbane down to Hobart, 
a private charter from uh, Tasmania up to uh, Flinders Range, and then a charter from Flinders Range down to Kangaroo Island. So our last um, stop for a few days is Kangaroo Island, um, and uh, there we will spend three nights um, in uh, either American River or Kingscote, and then we finish off uh, connecting through Adelaide um, on our way home. So I'm just going to briefly go over uh, some of the things we can expect to do and some of the creatures we can expect to see in each of these regions um, and go over it's the, the one of the things about these being the first few trips is that we have a, a, an understanding or an idea of what our itinerary is going to be and the outline of the itinerary that uh, any of you that are doing it um, would have been sent or what you can access on the uh, on the NADHAB website. But um, basically, with this being the first season of it running, things might change between now and let's say the end of the year. So we try and encompass everything that we have outlined in the itinerary, but there will still be a few tweaks and changes as we go through this first, um, first season. So, um, the Daintree and the Atherton Tablelands. So you can see there, this is Cairns um, down in the sort of uh, at the four o'clock arm of the clock. So we fly into Cairns, then we head up to the Daintree, uh, go across the Daintree River on a ferry, um, and head into the world's oldest rainforest. So a lot of eastern and northern Australia would have looked like this some 150, 180 million years ago. Um, and then as uh, climate has changed and continents have shifted, so this small pocket of rainforest has retreated into northern Queensland. Um, and there we are heading to look for the uh, world's angriest bird. Um, I still think ostriches are more dangerous, but the cassowary has got the reputation of being the world's most dangerous bird. Um, is uh, So we're looking for the southern cassowary in the Daintree, as well as um, saltwater crocodiles in the Daintree River and a plethora of bird species, and also just being in the world's oldest rainforest. Then from there, we head down south um, through the Atherton Tablelands into the town or an area called Yungaburra. And here we are looking for uh, bearded dragons, platypus, and tree kangaroos. Um, now, a tree kangaroo is a pretty unique animal in that most people, when they think of a kangaroo, they think of a big red roo. Um, and that's actually one of the newest additions to the evolutionary chain that is uh, kangaroos. Um, kangaroos actually originated with the Northern Queensland kangaroos or their, um, their ancestry. Um, and they were only discovered by uh, European settlers uh, within the last hundred years or so because they've got such secretive and elusive lifestyles living in the canopy trees uh, or the top of the canopy, should I say. So we'll spend a couple of days down there in Yungaburra um, and head on to Lake Boreen, think with some water dragons and whatnot. Um, so one of our first experiences is in Mossman Gorge. This is a local indigenous um, uh, experience where we'll have a local indigenous guide take us on a walk, a Dreamtime walk through the Mossman Gorge, showing us um, some traditional uses of plants, some traditional medicines, some, uh, some story times or some Dreamtime stories and then um, showing us a little depiction towards the end of their use of color and okra and ash um, to depict each of their tribal lineages. Um, First Nations Australians comprised huge diversity um, before the European settlers arrived. We were talking of several hundred different dialects and tribal factions um, that were on the, uh, on the continent itself. Um, and then from there, we head up into the Daintree, um, looking at something, well, the remnants of what a forest would have looked like when dinosaurs were still roaming. So these giant cycads and um, king tree ferns um, are just, I mean, you can see the boardwalk there. These are normal sized people, five and a half, six feet tall. And you're looking at a cycad there that is probably seven meters tall. Um, and they only grow sort of that much every couple of years. So really old, really primitive rainforest and just spectacular to spend time um, up there. Um, lots of bird species. The one on the left hand side is a Papuan frog mouth. Um, they're a, kind of best described like an owl across a night jar and they kind of they sit like this 
up against a tree in the daytime and they come out at night time. Um, and they're insectivorous nocturnal eat hunters. They've got these whiskers on their bill and they fly around and we usually see them in the daytime like this because you know the trees that they'll sometimes like to nest in. Um, and then uh, a remarkable diversity of uh, kingfishers um, across the Australia um, as well. Then uh, the ever-present saltwater crocodile. Um, these animals, unfortunately, have undergone a huge amount of pressure recently in northern Queensland. And our guides who we have up there are very, very strong spokespeople for uh, crocodile conservation and their their, how integral they are into these environments and these ecosystems um, and huge brand ambassadors for crocodiles. Um, so a chance to look for those on a um, on a ferry or on a on a boat cruise. We go on a, a, a one of the first ever, and the, I think it is the first of its kind, solar whisper. So it's a solar powered boat ride, um, and then also the opportunity to go for some night walks, uh, looking for some of these little uh, dragons, um, and uh, the ever elusive but ever present cassowary. So the southern cassowary, they are a six foot tall, six foot two um, bird that will creep around in the understory in um, in the Daintree. And there's several thousand of these individuals that are remaining. Uh, and the area that we uh, frequent in the Southern Daintree is one of the highest dense or the highest densities of these animals left in the rainforest. Um, but they're big birds, they walk across the road. Uh, their numbers are on the increase, um, but they're still a threatened species. You can see there how they do get that uh, the angry bird status. Um, the giant cask in their head, they don't use that for anything dangerous like that might look. Um, their appeal or lack thereof comes from these giant uh, feet that they've got with these big three big claws that they're known to stand up and sort of kick from. Um, not many human fatalities. I think it's the number is three and two of them were zookeepers in the US. So um, pretty good odds, um, but still just a, a remarkable animal to witness in the wild. Then, as we go up to the Atherton Tablelands, you can see that's one of our uh, our guides, James, standing next to this curtain fig. It's a giant strangler fig that broke its host tree and fell onto the fork of another tree, and then just developed all these secondary peripheral roots down, and it looks like this giant curtain. Um, and then heading up to the Tablelands, we've got a little uh, paddy melon there, and then a tree kangaroo on the right hand side. Um, some more nocturnal works, walks, looking for some possums, and then a visit to a Tolga Bat Hospital where we get to talk about some uh, micro and some mega bats and the difference between them. And then they have a present or looking for things like platypus and then the water dragon. So heading down south, we head to Lady Elliot. Um, as I mentioned, Coral Cay Island, you can see those three little white dots on the bottom left-hand side, those are the boats, the glass bottom boats that we have the chance to go out on. Um, and Lady Elliot's not just an island, just about snorkeling. Um, snorkeling is obviously, and diving is obviously the main focus, but there's so many other things to do there. Um, it's a rookery for many um, uh, ocean-bearing birds, um, as well as uh, migratory bird species. And um, their environmental impact and their recovery program, their conservation programs are just like out of this world. Um, this island um, was the bare spit of land with six trees on it when it was first turned into an ecotourism spot before its diving. Um, the island, because it's a coral cay, it was slowly formed over years of wave movement. Um, and so there was no soils. As birds arrived, they pooed. Uh, then they pooed the seeds, the seeds then germinated in the poo, and um, and that gave rise to this thriving ecosystem. Um, but then 150 years ago, the high levels of uh, nitrogen in poo, guano, um, made the, the poo that was on this island really desirable to make things like gunpowder. So this whole this whole island was basically stripped bare um, and the guano was removed and there were six trees left, which are still there today. Um, they survived because that was the only piece of shade that the workers, the miners could sit on uh, or sit under when it was really hot. Um, and the wind out there, certain times of the year um, in the sort of shoulder periods of the seasons, um, it can get up quite a bit when it gets warm. 
And so this area would have been one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. And now they've revived it back into this thriving ecosystem with migratory birds coming back. Um, the rookery is for the black cap noddies. And um, there are estimated as 75,000 individuals at the end of the breeding season. So there are about 30 or, so, 30 or so thousand pairs that call this home or 25,000 or so pairs that call this home. Um, and any time of the year, you'll find these birds there, but their numbers increase tenfold um, during the months of September and October into November. Um, and uh, yeah, just a really cool conservation initiative. So you can see there, the areas, the green zone is where uh, the beginner snorkelers will go. So that's where we go out and test our gear on day one. Then the blue and the yellow zones are the snorkel lines that we can follow out on the reef. And then the orange zone is for sort of your more experienced snorkelers and divers um, alike. Um, you can see the airstrip in the middle there, and then at the bottom, uh, sort of the, between the three and the six o'clock hand, where the green zone is, that's the lodge area. So most of the, the, the buildings and things are in an isolated part of the island um, to allow for everything else to be kept for conservation. Um, so lots of activities, as I mentioned, that you don't have to necessarily go snorkeling if the time, the climb, uh, the, the tide and the wind is uh, favorable, we can go out on an early morning reef walk. Um, so you get to actually walk out in the reef in the lagoon, it's a protected little coral area. Um, and our guides have one of the few licenses in the reef to actually be able to pick up some of these creatures. They can pick up uh, that beautiful blue sea star, some sea cucumbers, um, to show us these animals, um, and they do so obviously safely and respectfully, and all of that. Um, but then the main attraction is obviously the snorkeling. So uh, a variety of fish. There's a parrotfish there on the the left hand side, and then a juvenile hawksbill um, tortoise turtle um, on the the right hand side, um, and uh, that's a slightly older one, a little bit further out in the reef. Um, and then we do the conservation initiatives where we walk around with the local ecologist and understand a little bit more about what they've done and how they've revived this, go through their nursery, see this incredible uh, production of, um, of seedlings, and then they go out and everything stays on. So they've got desalination plants, they have everything solar, uh, the, all of the soil is that is grown essentially, you want to call it grown. So all of their food waste goes into a big mulcher and they make and produce their own soil. So everything is in-house. They bring in food and supplies and they take off people. That's about it. Uh, these are some of the noddies. Um, so these are the uh, the guys that use leaves and then poo glue to make their little, uh, their little um, nests. And these are the guys that are in numbers uh, exceeding sort of 65, 70,000 towards the end of the year. Um, and then another well-known bird, um, and another really special bird on the island is the red-tailed tropic bird. So one of the few birds in the world, and it's a pretty big bird, it's about the size of a gull with a fairly long tail, um, sort of a small silver gull, but they have the ability to fly backwards. So um, essentially hummingbirds, these guys, and then one or two other bird species, in the world have that ability to actually fly backwards, not turn direction and turn around and go backwards. They literally fly backwards. So when they're in their breeding display, they kind of, it almost looks like a Harrier. So it looks like a, a jet going backwards. Then from Brisbane, so we head back to Brisbane for a night um, and then we head down to Tasmania. So this is actually a, um, a little short beak to kidna that a, we photographed um, on a trip I just got back last week. Um, and the echidnas on Tasmania are really fuzzy. They're still spiky little guys. So one of the two monitoring. So we've seen the platypus up north. Um, we've looked for the platypus up north and we're gonna look for the platypus down here as well in Tasmania. But then the echidna is the other uh, monitoring. So the other egg laying mammal. Um, and the echidna is uh, awarded the let's say, uh, the mark of being the most widely distributed species of mammals across Australia. Um, so Australia known for their marsupials. So you've got marsupials, monotremes, and placentals. Those are the three classes of mammals. These guys are the most widely distributed across the entire continent. So you can find them all up in the Northern Territory, 
all the way down in Tasmania. They look a bit different, but they're the same species. Um, they are little insect eaters. They put that beak under the ground and probe around in the moss and the the, the sort of the little um, uh, layer of soil just above or just below the surface, looking for any invertebrates. Um, and then because they stick that little nostril of theirs under the ground, it gets clogged up with mud. So sometimes you'll see them blowing and they blow these little saliva bubbles to clear out their nostrils. It's really, really cute. No teeth, just a crushing plate. And then they've got feet that face backwards. So they can dig themselves uh, pretty much straight down into the ground. So if they feel threatened, they feel vibrations, they poke their head down, they cover up with their little, uh, their little spikes, and then they just go and dig themselves straight down. Really cool little guys, weird creatures. But that's what Tasmania is. Tasmania is just, it's a land of weirdness. Um, lots of cool stuff. Um, and we get to spend a good couple of days exploring um, down there. So uh, this is the big island of Tasmania. So we fly down and uh, we connect from Brisbane down to Hobart. Um, and then from there up to Maria Island, which is a new addition for any of the trips that we're doing uh, in Australia. So this is something new um, in, uh, in Tasmania. After that, we head up through to Gretna, uh, where we spent two nights at Truffle Lodge, kind of a, a, a safari styled tented camp on the, um, uh, on the banks of a river that we will do a little bit of, uh, uh, paddling with Platypus, the Derwent River. Um, and we spent two nights there. And then from there, we head up through the central highlands, sorry through the Central Highlands up to Cradle Mountain, where we spend a further two nights. So it's one night in Hobart, two nights at Truffle Lodge, two nights at Cradle Mountain. And then uh, we head up to Devonport uh, to catch our charter flight up to Ronsley. So a few things that uh, we're going to be looking at covering and visiting when we are in uh, Tasmania. So on the day of arrival, we land from Brisbane uh, we'll head to the hotel, um, which I'll cover in a little bit, the Mac One Hotel, uh, get checked in there. And then from there, we'll head across to one of Tasmania's most, well, I mean, in a biased opinion, Tasmania's most remarkable um, sanctuary and wildlife rehabilitation center. They're in the planning of building an entire hospital, not just a clinic for animals, for wild animals, and for animals that need rehabilitation and some that need constant care for the rest of their lives. Um, some of these animals will never be released. Um, and so they need to have that care because most of them are endangered species. Um, so the place called Bonorong, um, you can see there's a little Tasmanian devil up there um, on the top left hand side. The first of two opportunities uh, where we might get to see these guys in a sanctuary setting. Um, and uh, this is a population that has been crucial in the development of a vaccine for the uh, devil facial tumor disease, which is a, a saliva borne um, uh, cancer that spreads through uh, devils. And devils are typically scavengers, so they're feeding frenzy at a carcass, biting each other, doing all of that. They've got the strongest bite force out of any mammal in the world for their size. Um, so they swap saliva, infect one another, and then it does nothing to them besides just this giant tumor on their face. So it develops in their nasal cavity underneath and on their tongue, um, and it prevents them from eating. So they just, they die off that way. But the one thing that the devils have to their advantage is they've got a very quick life cycle. So you're talking about from birth to death under six years. Um, and so the rapid regeneration of those genetics as narrow as they are now, and the movement of that virus and being able to keep up with its uh, its evolutionary movement um, is helping them develop uh, a vaccine. And then um, the new technology through COVID, through the mRNA uh, technology is also helping these guys. Um, then top right, we've got, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, Stella, uh, that little wombat, I loved her. Um, but now she's grown up into a not so lovable, cuddly, fuzz fuzzy creature. Um, so wombats, they are carers at Bonorong, that their job at Bonorong is a wombat cuddler. That's no word of a lie. That's what they do. They cuddle wombats. Um, but then at about 18 months old, wombats turn into probably something that's a little bit more dangerous than a devil. 
Um, so a fully grown wombat's like 50 pounds and basically a bowling ball with fur and legs. Um, and they don't like to be told what to do. So at that time, that's when they're ready to be released. Um, and they either have a soft release if the animal is unable to fend for themselves in the wild or they release them in a conservation area and let them go about their uh, angry, normal lives. Uh, looking for things to run into if they don't want them in their way. Um, and then um, obviously some uh, kangaroos down there. This is a photo at sunset in the feeding area. The kangaroos were part of the, the wildlife park when it was acquired by the uh, the rescue center and the hospital. Um, and so all of these here, none of them have been captured and put into the, into the, the park. They're free roaming. They can do what they want. They can't leave um, in terms of leave the actual sanctuary because then that would be a porous area for the other animals but these animals are free to come and go through the the areas that have people and the areas that don't um and then on to uh, maria island um where uh, we'll spend a day so the next day we hop onto we head into our vehicles drive up to triviana um, and then head across the short little bit of ocean to maria island um, on our private charter boat and then we spend the day uh, cruising around the island on the boat and then hopping off at a few places and driving around to see some of the, the scenes and that uh, bird in the middle there uh, was a Cape Barren goose and it's a, a, a sanctuary for these geese um, they're really large uh, mainly terrestrial goose they can still fly um, but these guys haven't done so well on the mainland um, so this area is is pretty well protected for them then as we go further up north um, towards Gretna, we head to uh, Mount Field National Park, some beautiful big tree ferns, some really tall trees. The world's largest flowering plant is found in this uh, forest and just some spectacular waterfalls uh, to see along the way. And then that day we finish our day off with a, uh, a kayaking experience on the Derwin River, really easy, um, easy, uh, kayak, not anything higher grade uh, rapids or anything like that. Kind of, you basically just have to steer your kayak. You're not, you're not having to put in too much effort to paddle. Um, and if the conditions are right, really, really great um, viewing of platypus from inside the water with them. Um, now, in terms of, and I'll come back to this a bit later, but uh, in terms of the gear required for this, they provide the helmets, they provide the life vests and everything. But the reason we recommend uh, rain pants for this departure is not only for the hikes in Cradle Mountain, but also for this experience. So when going down the river, if there's anything more than a slight breeze, uh, the kayak splash can blow back. And we're out in the we're out in the water for about two hours or so. Um, and if it's a, if it's a windy day, you can get off with pretty wet pants. So that's the main reason we recommend um, rain pants for this departure, as opposed to things like your Gore-Tex gaiters and stuff like that. Um, th those are great for hiking, but when you're sitting on your bum, um, gaiters aren't gonna do much to keep your bum dry. So rain pants for this, you don't have to bring them. If you don't mind getting your bum wet, it's okay. Um, but if you wanna stay a little bit dry, that's why we recommend rain pants. And then, as we leave Gretna, we head up through the Central Plateau, um, which is home to uh, hundreds of caves in a network of these sort of underground limestone back remnants of the rivers from when it was all uh, an underwater, well, basically an ocean, uh, a landlocked ocean or a giant lake. Um, and we visit either Mara Cooper or King Solomon's Caves, depending on, um, on the water levels in Mara Cooper Caves. Um, and just spectacular caves, these giant uh, crystallines, the stalagmites, stalactites, um, and you spend about an hour there. Uh, they are pretty large and cavernous, so anyone that is a little bit scared of claustrophobic spaces, um, besides getting in there, uh, it's pretty open uh, out. You can see there, I mean, that's some of the, the smaller areas, and they're still, you've got 15 feet above you. There are a few areas where you've got to duck down and kind of go through, but you don't have to crawl. Um, it's all pathway, it's all lit. Um, and uh, yeah, just a really cool experience going uh, in these caves. And then we head up to the Northwest to Cradle Mountain. So 
this is I've done I don't know a dozen trips there or so uh, over the last two years. Uh, this is the second time I got to see Cradle Mountain. Um, so for the most part, it's pretty cloudy and cold, um, which brings me to another point of the uh, the gear that we're bringing on this, and I'll reiterate this towards the end. But we're covering two very or several different climatic zones, but the two ones to note are the Daintree, which is a rainforest, and then Tasmania, which can be cold. Uh, you'll see in a, few, in a few slides time, there was a photograph of some snow that was taken last March. Um, on the mainland, it was 75 and sunny, and then by the time we got down to Tasmania the next afternoon, uh, it was 31 degrees. Um, so that's why we recommend the multiple, multiple levels of layers for this itinerary. Um, so you've got your hard shell on the outside that's wind and rainproof, and then you layer in all the way through to your base layers. Um, and then your footwear, none of it is really a technical rocks or things like that. There are a few places in maybe the Flinders range and down in Tasmania where a little bit of ankle support is, is always a good idea. But the main reason for that foot support and that having decent uh, either walking shoes or walking boots is for the potential cold when we're down in Tasmania. Um, you can see there, that's what I was talking about at the bottom there, that was snow. So went to bed at night and it was 60 degrees outside and beautiful sunshine. Woke up the next morning to beautiful snow um, and it was 30 degrees. So it can happen overnight um, and that's what we just need to be prepared for on this. Then you can see there little Paddy Millen giving us a, uh, blowing his tongue at us. Um, and he, was, he was trying to get something off of his uh, off of his tongue, um, a leaf or something, and it just looked like he was pulling a face. Um, and then a little wombat there walking next to the boardwalk. So those boardwalks are there for our um, for our enjoyment to be able to walk in amongst these uh, the sort of high altitude alpine grassland. Um, an area like this, if you were to have people just continuously walking over that vegetation, it would be absolutely destroyed. So these boardwalks are there for the safety and the protection of the environment. Um, but then it also gives us that elevated, don't have to walk around in slush and mud and anything like that. Um, this is actually a couple of weeks ago on an Australia South adventure. I just thought it was a really cool photo of a wombat enjoying a ridiculous scratch on the back of his leg. Um, he was so happy. He was so just stoked to be getting that itch. Um, but yeah, this is an animal that can weigh sort of 50, 55 pounds. Uh, they stand about that tall that big like a big bulldog just solid stocky muscle um and then lots of different walks the enchanted forest uh king Billy pines walk all of those things it's weather dependent so when we get there we usually see what the weather's doing on the day of arrival we usually arrive in the later afternoon if it's nice weather we go out for a walk in the evening um before dinner have dinner maybe a night walk depending on the uh, on how long on how late it gets dark and then in the morning that we're there we um we head out fairly early to uh, to get into the national park before the shuttle start running so that we can have breakfast in the field and then um do a couple of walks uh, depending on uh the keenness of the group um and one of the great things about these departures is they are essentially two expedition leaders or one expedition leader and one expedition leader in training to allow us to be able to, if there's a slightly more physically capable uh, half of the group that want to go on a longer walk, we can split the group in two. Um, and that enables us to uh, be able to accommodate various levels of uh, physical needs. Um, and another just walking through the uh, this tundra here, um, this is looking essentially looking down from the area where we have breakfast um, in the on our first morning there. Then that afternoon after lunch, uh, we head for an evening or late afternoon into evening activity uh, at Devils of Cradle, which is one of the sanctuaries for Tasmanian devils that are breeding and uh, getting good genetics into a disease-free population of devils. And uh, if we're lucky enough, we might get to witness a feeding. Um, and then that's where you get to hear where they get their name from of that sound. They sound like, I mean, if you can imagine what a devil sounds like, um, just this sort of screaming cry 
as they're fighting one another for food. Um, they're not even paying any attention to the guide there. She's in the enclosure with them holding a wallaby leg um, and they're just focused on the wallaby leg. Um, so a really cool experience there to get to see them up close um, and ask questions to local experts um, about their, their biology and, um, and what we're doing to save these animals. And that's another thing that we, we focus on a lot with this itinerary is in every place and every uh, region that we visit, we meet with local experts in the field, uh, researchers and um, ecologists who have dedicated their lives to the saving of individual species or ecosystems on the whole. Um, and this is a really good example of that, uh, just on the road from where we stay in Cradle Mountain at Devil's Cradle. So from there, we drive up to Devonport, um, where we catch our midday flight up to the Flinders Ranges, the Akara Flinders Ranges National Park. And there we will be at Rawnsley Station, which is a working sheep farm um, that over the last few years have actually moved and evolved from being a completely dependent uh, uh, sheep farm and um, livestock outpost to being tourism and conservation with sheep on the sideline to keep the restaurant um, filled with, with, with delicious Australian lamb. Um, and then they also sell a lot of the wool products um, that are, are made um, from the sheep on the, uh, on the, the station. So a really cool uh, example of how something like a, um, uh, a farm or a station has turned into conservation and tourism. And that's only through support from groups like ours. So we're there for three nights. Um, it's just on the outskirts of the National Park. Um, and this is our home base for a couple of nights. And these beautiful eco villas set into the foothills of that, at the bottom left there, the, the ridge that you're looking at there, um, if you were to look at it from above, it's it looks like what the the native First Nations Australians described as um, as serpents. So it looks like almost two serpents that have their heads um, around the top of each other. And it's an area called Wilpina Pound, um, and that's this giant crater um, that we'll be exploring the periphery of and inside of for the three nights that we're there. Um, some of the focal animals for the three days that we're there, we've got. The classic other big bird in Australia, the emu. Uh, then in the middle of there, that those big muscular um, red roos. Now these guys are not as common as what one would think when you think of outback Australia, because that's essentially where we are. We're in the outback. Um, now they are typically in fairly dense vegetation in the middle of the day because they're quite big. So they need to help cool down. This is an area that can get exceedingly hot um in the sort of 120 range um not during the time that we're there but in the peak of summer and um so in the middle of the day they're usually in the denser vegetation so we don't look for them in the middle of the day this was taken at a sunrise coffee break or sunrise coffee stop um one morning at um what's called the, the, the casno tree which is a giant gum tree that was photographed by a french photographer about 100 years ago and it Put, basically put this place on the map um, and the whole open plain in front of this Casno tree um, were these guys, these big red roos. But then within 40 minutes, 30 minutes, the sun being up, they all disappeared into the thickets. So that's one of the things that we'll be doing uh, when we're there. We wake up really early in the morning. We drive about 20 minutes to get to the spot. And that's where we'll look for these big, iconic outback animals, the big red kangaroo. And then the little guy on the um, the, the right hand side there is a rock wallaby. So we find them in the the gorges. So the Bracknell Gorge um, is a, a particularly good area to view them, and they spend the majority of their lives up in these rocky cliffs, living in caves, um, and only coming down in the evenings to eat the vegetation on the edges of um, of the gorges. Um, and then we also get to do a couple of experiences, uh, one with a, a local indigenous guide uh, where we go up the Sacred Canyon. So we go up there and it's some of the most ancient forms of rock art uh, and depictions of stories and dream times uh, in the area. We're looking at about, I think it's about 50 or 60,000 years ago. They've aged some of these. 
Um, and then we also go to Okaroo Rock, uh, which is down at the bottom right. And that's where they started uh, using okra um, to depict stories and dream times. Um, and then the rock on the top right is just a really cool looking rock. I just thought it was cool. And it's on that walk. Um, so that's about halfway up uh, the gorge to Akaru Rock. Then from there, uh, we hop down to um, Kangaroo Island. So we, we get on our second and final uh, charter flight for the itinerary to Kangaroo Island. And that's, this is the last stay. And I'm just looking at the time. I'm actually doing a lot better than I thought it would be uh, for time. So uh, Kangaroo Island, we're home uh, there for three nights. Um, and uh, there are actually more koalas on the island than kangaroos, but the koalas were introduced. So it will stick with Kangaroo um, Island name. Um, so Exceptional Kangaroo Island, um, that's the team that we uh, will be with while we're there. So we fly into Kingscote Airport and all of these stars represent the regions that we'll go to, but in no particular order. We just do it determined uh, based on um, where the uh, the ecologists, the researchers, and um, the, the the speakers that we're going to be meeting with, where it fits in with their schedule. So basically, what we'll see over the this map is what we're going to be doing in the three days that we're there. But it's not order from start to finish. So we we, we fly into Kingscote, and we'll either stay in Kingscote or American River um, for our three nights there. Um, beautiful little. Uh, small hotels, boutique hotels on the water. Um, and those will be home bases for the three days that we're there. Then uh, some points to look at Seal Bay for um, the Australian fur seal um, and sea lions. And then Stokes Bay as well, followed by um, Cape Cooley and Admiral's Arch. And then some rocks that are pretty remarkable. You'll hear that joke when you're on safari in Australia by the expedition leaders many times, and we giggle every single time. Um, so just forewarning you. And uh, then um, this is Pelican Lagoon. So that's where we meet with uh, one of our ecologists who so we get to talk about the kidneys. Um, and followed by uh, the far eastern extremity of the island, the furthest um, lighthouse on the east, and then um, False Bay uh, wineries or False Cape wineries, sorry, um, which is uh, we'll have a sort of a wine tasting one of the evenings um, and finally finish at a, an outdoor dinner in a conservation park, listening to some of the conservation success stories of the island. So just a brief overview of that. Um, so this is on Seal Bay. Uh, we have special permission to come down onto the beach uh, with our guides. We don't have to come with the park ranger because our guides have been working with the, the park for so long. And then um, some other iconic creatures on the island. So the koala lying there, it was pretty hot that day. So you see them lying like that with their, their the only bit of exposed skin they have is in the palms of their hands, their feet, and then the patch on their chest. So that's the way they cool down. Then we've got the Western gray kangaroos, quite big guys, but nowhere near as big as the, the big red roo. Um, and then some uh, seals, the top right there. This is a Rosenberg's goannon, um, which is one of the uh, key conservation success stories of the island and a species that is actually uh, doing remarkably well um, in recent years. Um, because it's on an island, they weren't susceptible to the effects of some of the things that on the mainland they were, but Kangaroo Island um, have got a big push to uh, the removal of feral cats. And these are one of the species that were heavily impacted by the introduction of cats uh, in the last 60 to 100 years or so. Um, then some beautiful scenes and lighthouses. This is a lighthouse near um, Admiral's Arch at Cape Cooley. Um, and some rocks that some might say are quite remarkable. Uh, so these are 500 million year old rocks and basically it's a, it's a granite boulder that have these three or four clusters of rocks of granite that have been exposed to um, uh, the elements for about 500 million years or so. So that's wind, that's rain, that's all kinds of erosion that you can imagine. And because of the shifting weather patterns, it's given them these unique shapes. 
Um, some people see the bill of a, of a, of a hawksbill turtle, or if you look at it from the other side, you might see a crocodile. Um, it's just the really cool rocks um, out on the far west coast. Then, doing a really good time here. Um, quickly, our accommodations throughout um, our trip are 20 days um, on our epic ultimate Australian safari. Um, so for any of you or most of you who have traveled with Nat have know that our focus is the nature and the experiences that we get to, uh, to get to do in the regions that we visit and we stay at the most comfortable accommodations um, on uh, in that in those locations so our locations will vary from very simple basic uh, like we have here at the top right wanderers rest in kangaroo island or um, heritage lodge up in the daintree in the top right all the way through to the beautifully brand new remodeled mac one hotel in hobart um, known as the storytime hotel where every room has a different uh, First Nations individual that it's themed around and a story around that individual um, and how they were pivotal and uh, really important in their communities. Um, all the way down to Lady Elliot Island, an island resort, but a very basic island resort, but we're on the Great Barrier Reef, um, to the luxurious Truffle Lodge at the bottom, which is a safari inspired uh, tented camp on the Derwent River with Meru style tents, so much like those that you would find anywhere in Kenya, Tanzania, anywhere in Africa. And then the beautiful eco villas um, of Rawnsley Park, which is underneath that, our accommodation sign. So that red, that red uh, wall unit there is an eco villa at Rawnsley Park. So a, a varying range of accommodations, but each has their own unique uh, beauty. Um, and some are just a little bit more luxurious than others, but they are the best in the areas that we visit. Then just a couple of things, sort of housekeeping, let's call it that. Um, so internet and cell service, there's pretty much Wi-Fi at all of the places that we are staying, but cell service might vary from destination to destination. But for the most part, connectivity will be constant, even if it's just for a couple of hours a day where we're staying. Um, the money and gratuity, so uh, it's obviously the Australian dollar. Um, but gratuities and things like that, as with all NatHab trips, all of those, with the exception of the expedition leaders at the end of the trip, are already covered by us um, in the cost of your trip. And any gratuities that you wish to give along the way, over and above that, and for the expedition leader at the end, you can give that in US dollars, though, which is the question that was sent ahead of time. So just something to think about. Um, you don't have to go and try and draw a couple of hundred or whatever, um, uh, or however much you need, Australian dollars at ATMs, bit by bit by bit. You don't have to exchange your US dollars when you get there unless you want to. Most places will accept credit card and then the gratuities at the end, you can give in dollars. Electricity and charging, 220 to 240 volts, um, but most of the, the modern appliances, cameras, phones, that kind of thing, um, will be able to, to um, with the use of an adapter, be able to get um, electricity there. Uh, laundry, so laundry is available throughout the trip, not at every place, but certainly every four or five days, there's a facility or a service that can be offered. Um, and uh, the general recommendation for this trip is that you're not spending every second day that you're at a place wanting to do laundry. Is that we kind of look at about the, if you, if you can have clothes, that will do for about seven to nine days or so uh, without having to do laundry. Um, there is a laundry facility um, at Heritage Lodge in, uh, in the Tablelands. And uh, there is a, a self-service laundry on Lady Elliot. There is a um, dry cleaning facility at Mac One, but we're not there for long enough to use that. Then Cradle Mountain, uh, there's a, a laundry facility, a 24-hour laundry on the premises that you can go and use and do your own with a, a washer and a dryer. Um, and then um, in Rawnsley Park, uh, all of the eco villas have their own eco laundries in the unit, so you can do laundry there. And then when we are on Kangaroo Island, um, the accommodations that we stay at either have a laundry service where they will do laundry for us, but it has to be staggered by the group. So not everyone can put their laundry in on the last day or the first day. We have to kind of talk amongst the group to figure out um, 
uh, when each person can do that, but there are facilities for that. Um, footwear and gear, we've kind of gone over that. Um, and if there are any more questions um, in the Q&A, which we'll have a bit of time for now, um, we can go over that. But footwear recommends something like a, if you if you want to bring a water shoe with uh, for the time on Lady Elliot. If not, they do have reef shoes for the use while the, while uh, you're on the island. But they don't always guarantee a size or or um, that they'll have something available for you. Um, so I usually take my own um, sort of water shoe with and then um, a decent pair of uh, like hiking shoe or hiking boot and then just a casual shoe uh, to wear when you're not wearing the other stuff. Valuables and things like that. A lot of the locations that we stay at are really safe. Um, but just for peace of mind, if you don't want to leave valuables or carry them with you, uh, a recommendation that has come up because a lot of the places don't have electronic safes. Um, and some of them do, some don't, but just bring a spare uh, or an extra padlock for your suitcase and you can just lock your valuables in your bag for the day when we're out um, on our activities. Um, and then luggage, we are taking a combination of commercial airlines, so a flight Qantas from Cairns to Brisbane, Virgin Australia from Brisbane to Hobart, and then a charter from Davenport to Rawnsley and Rawnsley to Kangaroo Island. Um, we are obviously at the mercy of the charter companies and the airlines, um, but our recommendation is no more than you've got two items um, or a combination weight of items, um, but we're looking at about 17 or 18 kgs for a check bag and no more than seven or eight kgs for a carry-on bag. Um, Lady Elliot is a lot, it's different to that. We do have duffel bags at the Siebel Hotel for guests to repack their bags to be able to get those to Lady Elliot. And we have a luggage storage facility. So the night that we get into Brisbane from Cairns, um, if you need a duffel bag to be able to get your luggage underneath 33 pounds, which is their specific um uh recommend or not recommendation their specific rule we have duffel bags to allow you to pack that and we're on an island for three days so it's basically swim costume a couple of layers if it gets windy and uh toiletries and that sort of thing um but your expedition leader will go over that the day before sort of thing and then uh meals it's a combination of field meals restaurant meals and lodge or uh, hotel meals um, where we try and uh, try and showcase the best of local cuisine um, throughout. So uh, when we're on Kangaroo Island, we'll be eating stuff from Kangaroo Island that Kangaroo Island is known for. When we're in the Daintree, we'll be getting some traditional just dishes there or a choice thereof. But there is a pl there is plenty of choices throughout, and dietary requirements and dietary needs and specifics are very well catered for. Um, but it is a lot of meals and it's a lot of food. So don't feel uh, bad if you want to skip a meal here or if you want to just have one course instead of three there. Um, but just speak to your expedition leader about that. Okay, awesome. Rob, let's turn it in, try and see how many questions we can whack out in 10 minutes. Rob. Hello. I'm going to send Rob a message here. Well, I can't do that. Okay. Well, I'll just see if I have any other questions that were sent ahead of time. Um, so when we go to Lady Elliot, uh, there is obviously the option to go snorkeling. Um, they do have, they do offer us complimentary mask and uh, snorkel. Um, uh, rental, which is included in our stay, as well as a wetsuit. So you can either have a half wetsuit or a full length wetsuit, depending on um, on your preferences. But the the water temperature there in the next on the next two trips is pretty warm, coming to the end of summer. So you're looking at like 24, 25 degrees Celsius. Um, but definitely something if snorkeling is something that you want to do and that you're interested in, 
If you can practice ahead of time, that is a great idea and a good recommendation. But if not, um, then when we first arrive, we'll be able to head out onto uh, one of the lagoons or into the swimming pool just to fit some of the gear to make sure that everything's nice and sealed for when we get out into the open ocean. Um, and then, um, yeah, I don't have any other notes on my side. So I think anyone that has sent a specific question, um, because I've lost comms with Rob, uh, we might just have to have those shared after the fact and I'll do my best to answer them or your uh, your concierge, your trip concierge or your trip um, advisor will be able to get back to you with a couple of questions or answers to those questions um, if you've asked anything specific. But um, yeah, I hope everyone has enjoyed um, the uh, the very quick info blurb that is Ultimate Australia Safari. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in and for signing up today and signing on. And as always, thanks to NADHAB uh, for allowing us and giving us this opportunity and platform uh, to present and connect with all of you at home um, with what we get to view in the field. Um, and to their ongoing partnership and commitment to the WWF and to um, conservation through exploration and being able to go to these remarkable and incredible places um, and in doing so kind of help in conserving these amazing places and creatures um, that we get to view and witness while we are out there. So I don't know how I'm going to end this webinar. Um, but once I turn off my screen, I think then your screen will be turned off for what I'm saying. So this is the first time I've ever been done in under an hour or in an hour, should I say. Um, so for those of you for tuning in, thank you so much and have a lovely day ahead. It's almost midnight here in South Africa, so I'm going to bed. Have a great day, everyone. And thanks again. Thanks, Rob. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but, um, yeah, I think I ended off okay. Uh, let me know if I need to say anything else. Cool.